Welcome. If you are tuning in, then you are here for a discussion about government assets to enrich educational experiences and games. And we are very excited to have you here. Thank you so much for uh, making it to the end of Games for Change. And I hope you had a wonderful experience so far. We are all here from the, yes, we'll be sharing contact info after the presentation. But we're all here from the Federal Game Skill, which is an informal community of practice of cross government agencies and entities who are all interested in supporting the ethos of game based approaches to meet their mission goals, which is a lot to say we all like games, we like to use games to help figure out how we can better engage and help the American people. There's a link down below, you will not have to you will not have to screenshot any of these resources. We'll be providing as an incentive for getting to the end of the presentation, a Google doc that has all of the links gathered up so you don't have to, to worry about it there. Um, of course, you are welcome to take screenshots in which case I'll start posing for it. I'm Liz Newberry, I'll be your cruise director for this evening. I'm also the director of the Serious Games Initiative at the Wilson Center. I'm joined with, with my colleagues from NASA, Shobana, and my colleagues from the Smithsonian, Drew and Cody. And we're all here to talk to you about different government assets. So in the federal government space, there's folks who fund games, there's folks who make games, but there's also a growing interest in ways that we can create resources that can be used in multiple education and outreach initiatives. And that includes open data, fair data, um, wonderful museum assets that are being digitized that we're gonna learn about more today. And one thing I wanted to say really quickly is although we are speaking for our agencies today, if you are not necessarily aligned with the content that we're looking at, um, please do feel free to connect with us. And we likely know someone in the federal sphere who's working on that sort of a topic area. It's a big wide world of federal government. So uh, we're happy to make those connections as necessary. Again, we're all here to support education and game-based approaches. I'm gonna lead off before uh, passing the hat on to my colleagues here. And it's gonna be kind of a whirlwind. We're not gonna go too deep into any of these particular assets. What I wanna make sure is that we have time for questions and answers. So feel free to put them into the chat as you have them, and then we'll address them all at the end after everyone has gone. Um, as I said before, I'm Liz Newbury. I'm from the Wilson Center. Uh, the Wilson Center is a strictly nonpartisan public policy think tank, which is a big way of saying that instead of making a, a place for pigeons to land on as a statue or something, Congress decided to make a living memorial to President Woodrow Wilson to honor his international policy legacy. So we're an international think tank. We put scholars and those who are conducting research together with those who are uh, policy directors and leaders to try to make uh, and amplify key points of public discourse. The Serious Games Initiative was founded with a pretty simple um, concept. How do we make public policy, which is very complex, winky wonky as it were, um, accessible and engaging to the broader public and to more people other than the wonderful, intelligent, brilliant people who are talking about it within the Beltway. So one of the ways that we've thought about doing that is through games and part of that very simply is people use games, people love games, but also because of the infrastructure and the ethos that surrounds games and game-based pedagogy. I also know that I would much rather play a game about a particular topic that I may not have fully engaged with rather than reading a 25 page policy brief about it. So that's one of the things that sort of motivates us. We're very much in the FGG space of the ethos of making and creating and researching games. Some of the games that we have produced, not all of them use public uh, assets, but we do engage a wide variety of audiences. Not all of them are public audiences, but it's ways to leverage games to help uh, elevate and progress policy discourse. So some of the examples I have here of games that we've produced are games where I've gone to China and developed a game for a uh, live action role play game for uh, NGOs there as part of a workshop. It was very meta. It was showing how to make a game without actually 
making a digital game because as we know, NGOs are generally very strapped for resources. So we developed a game out of PowerPoint using uh, water policy, um, just, just uh, trying to show them how to, to make a game that way. Another uh, collaboration that we did is for uh, the city of Sao Paulo, Brazil, where we helped uh, support and develop a game called Cities in Play, where you can be mayor for a day. And that was designed for student audiences. It's integrated in a lot of schools as part of their civic education program. One of the other games that we've made most recently, uh, very much in the ethos of the things that we're working on at the Wilson Center is about de defeating disinformation. And that was a war game, so a, a tabletop exercise developed for policymakers in a closed door workshop to help them not only identify, uh, identify disinformation, be able to whack a troll as it were, as well as develop strategies and uh, processes to navigate disinformation beyond, uh, beyond that particular workshop. So it's really more about the application of an existing model produced by the UK government called the Resist Toolkit. And that is sort of in the asset space. So I'm happy to talk about that more deeply uh, later. Largely, it was taking an existing public document and really just trying to underscore some of the lessons learned from that document. So happy to talk about it. But one of the games I did want to talk about is an example of existing data that we've used. And then I wanted to talk about an opportunity that at the Wilson Center we've been, started to develop, which is an open access model. So if the first is a game, the second is an actual open data portal. In terms of the game, the Wilson Center really cut its teeth uh, with a series of games called Budget Hero. It took one of the potentially least exciting topics that we work on in the federal government, the, the federal budget, and try to make it a little bit more exciting and engaging for the average audience. Um, it was designed for middle school on up. It's, uh, the current rendition is called The Fiscal Ship, and it's been played over 800,000 times worldwide. And this was a partnership with the Brookings Institute to try to really underscore the message of how do we, in a very nonpartisan way, allow people the tools to play through policy with the ultimate goal of just reducing our national debt, which is a nonpartisan issue. With the idea being that we want people to set their own goals, whether they want to be a tax cutter or shrinking government, uh, or whether they want to um, sort of engage social security and defend the environment. They get to pick their own goals at the beginning and they get to play through it. And one of the ways that we used an existing asset was we use congressional budget office projections the Congressional Budget Office comes up with 10-year projections about policy impacts on the national, um, a national budget. And we took those uh, projections, extended them to a 25-year projection, and then mapped it to policy discourse, so policies that are being discussed within the context of the federal budget that would then impact national debt. So it was a partially a translation issue, an extension issue. Thank you, Lori, I really appreciate that. Um, so in any case, one of the things that we did with that is we not only took the projections and extended them, but then we had to map them with policies that are being talked about. These policies, we created a description and a pros and cons that was then uh, sort of evaluated by a nonpartisan board at the Brookings Institute and then we put those into the game so that people could then map it to the national debt. And the whole idea again is to demonstrate what actually has an impact on debt and how can we meet in a nonpartisan way those policy goals. So I'm happy to dig into this a little bit more deeply if you have questions. I'm also gonna link in the Google document, uh, a link to our teaching resources because we did design this for middle school and up. And a part of those teaching, yeah, uh, part of those teaching resources we developed as uh, part of this to help explain the economics behind it. I wanted to really quickly also highlight an uh, upcoming data set that we're gonna be producing at the Wilson Center, which is through the Earth Challenge 2020 project. This project engages three different audiences, the citizen science community, which are people who go out and sort of democratize science, the other communities that they engage are policymakers as well as researchers. 
So it's uh, the creation of the data set and it's mapped to the UN sustainability goals. The whole idea behind the Earth Challenge 2020 project is to be to generate 100 billion points of data, 1 billion, 1 billion points of data, not 100 billion. There's an economist in this room who probably caught that. But in any case, uh, so we are mapping that data from existing science and science projects like SciStarter, iNaturalist, and mapping it to an, a cloud, a cloud data set, and then also generating new data through our Earth Challenge app. This, this data is uh, FAIR data enabled, it's open data, and the whole, it will be launching in August uh, 15th. The particular research questions that this data set um, collects are mapped to the UN sustainability goals. And we operationalize these in six different categories. We didn't try to tackle all of the UN's goals, but we did try to find a specific way of operationalizing it that maps to both existing citizen science projects as well as progresses research questions in these areas. Throughout the process, we've been engaging the broader research community, and we've also been evaluating it based on the needs and the requests of that research community as well as the citizen science community. The six core research questions that we're tackling through the app and the data cloud and all of this goodness are air quality, uh, biodiversity as operationalized by pollinators. So you get to go out and take pictures of bees and it's very lovely. Food sustainability and plastic pollution, which I've personally helped uh, a lot with that mapping by taking dogs, my dog on walks and collecting plastics in our neighborhood. The air quality and the plastic pollution actually launched during COVID. And part of the reason for that selection was because the air quality is easy to do from just your window. So all you have to do is take a picture outside your window and it will generate um, data off of that for the air quality in your area. The upcoming uh, apps and widgets that we're coming out with are around climate change and then also water quality. So those, those are sort of the research questions that we're working on. And one of the things that's gonna progress this further is the actual visualization of this data. So the intention of this data is to help inform policymakers, to help them make more informed decisions. It's a snapshot of the current environmental quality. And one of the ways that we are trying to transform that after all of this data has been collected is through collaborations with uh, the broader uh, technology community. Um, and one of those collaborations is with Esri, and we're putting a lot of this data into story maps. Happy to talk a little bit more about what that means, but Esri is a ArcGIS uh, producer, and they basically, they make maps and they make them almost better than anyone else. So we are very excited to be working with them and really making this data come to life through uh, data visualizations like this. If you have any questions, I know that was a bit of whirlwind, we're going to be talking in the Q&A, but if you have any questions about games, talk to me. If you have any questions about Earth Challenge, my colleagues, Dr. Ann Bowser and Matisse are very readily available and I'll share their contact information as well. Again, Earth Challenge is not currently a game, but it is an existing resource that could be used for a game. And thank you so much for bearing with that. I'm gonna pass the mic now over to my colleagues at NASA. Awesome, thanks so much, Liz. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Shobana Gupta. I am in the uh, Earth Science Division at NASA headquarters. And today I wanted to share some uh, NASA stories as well as assets with you all um, and invite you all to see the world of information that we have that we hope that you all get inspired by and potentially incorporate in your games. So um, Liz, if you move on to uh, the first slide's probably just intro, so hello. And then the next slide um, I'll do. Um, so uh, NASA currently has uh, over 20 instruments that uh, are in space and gathering data about our planet. They look at our atmosphere, our hydrosphere, our lithosphere, which is the Earth's, essentially the surface, the crust and the upper man mantle, um, the cryosphere, which is ice, and then the biosphere, which is uh, the sum of all living things, including you, know, you and me. Uh, and these instruments are either on independent satellites that are either geostationary or orbiting the Earth, 
or they're on the International Space Station, and they collect data from around the world continuously, allowing us to have a global picture of Earth's dynamic systems over time. So using these Earth observations, um, uh, and also observations not just from space, but also from air, land, uh, on sea, and, um, and from, uh, from, from various sources, allows us to better understand our planet's interconnected systems. Um, within Earth's apply, uh, the Earth Science Division, we do four main things. We develop, launch, and operate a massive fleet of Earth-observing satellites, um, which you see represented here on this slide. Um, we also support uh, the development and testing of new scientific technologies, and also research that advances our knowledge of our planet. And then the program where I work is the Applied Sciences program, where we encourage the innovative and practical uses of our Earth observations and scientific knowledge. And if you hear a baby in the background, I apologize. That's my, my baby niece who's visiting uh, and who probably just wants to participate in the panel. So, um, so if we move to the next slide. Um, great, thank you. So within our Applied Sciences program, we work with a lot of different people and organizations from different sectors. That includes health and air quality, um, uh, people who work at the, uh, uh, at the, in terms of preparing for disasters as well as responding to them, people in conservation and water management sectors. And together with, with these different individuals and organizations, we try to understand and apply data together to make better and more informed decisions. I've listed our program area's uh, website on top. It's essentially um, appliedsciences.nasa.gov. And if you would like to hear more, uh, thanks Liz, uh, if, if you'd like any um, to, to read more about our work, I encourage you to go to our website. But um, I particularly wanted to highlight our program's projects because I think they're wonderful examples of how data from space can be you know, applied to um, and inform decisions that we make on Earth and for Earth. And I think they're super interesting stories and could even be great storylines for future games. So uh, what I'm gonna do now is share an example of these stories with you. So uh, if we move to the next slide, um, this is a picture of uh, Lake Okeechobee in Florida. And does anybody, um, you know, you might have to make the, the click on the presentation slide to make sure you can see it clearly, but can you, can you identify what those green lines are that you see um, in the lake? You can just tap them, uh, type it out in the chat section. What do you think those are? All right. <laughs> um, so Eric is right. They, uh, they are. Um, they are, Eric and Noah, thank you. Yeah, they're algae. These are blooms of algae or algal blooms. Um, if we go to the next slide, we can actually see that, you know, algae can look like a lot of different things. Um, that the former picture was from Florida. This particular one, you see those green clumps on the northern shore of Lake Erie. Um, so not all algal blooms are harmful, but a lot of these blooms can have uh, different effects ranging from mildly annoying to even fatal impacts. Um, for example, blooms can release airborne toxins, which um, to a, an otherwise healthy person might, might cause irritation, maybe a cough or some other respiratory mild symptoms. But to someone with a respiratory illness um, like asthma, they can be you know, extremely uh, dangerous or even life-threatening. Uh, some other algal blooms can release uh, toxins, which if ingested can cause damage to your GI tract, to your liver, and can even be fatal. So, so these blooms can be very detrimental, not only affecting health of humans, but also health um, within the water bodies uh, where they are, so the ecosystem where they're found, um, and also the economy of a particular region. You know, if, if you have a region that's dependent on, let's say, beachgoers, and you have a massive bloom on, on the coastline that that prevents people from enjoying that, that beach and the beach has to be closed down, that's a huge economic impact to that region. Um, and so in this particular example, uh, there was a massive bloom in Lake Erie in 2014. And it was so bad that the city of Toledo had to actually issue a do not 
use the water, do not even touch water warning for the people. And this impacted over 500,000 individuals. So where does NASA come in? Well, NASA scientists at the Glenn Research Center in Ohio were actually able to work with public health managers in the city of Toledo. They were able to give information to these city managers in advance that allowed them to forecast if there was going to be a bad bloom. Um, and this advanced information can allow them to have water treatments on hand, you know, readily available to, to um, send out if, if necessary, uh, minimizing the impact to the public. So stories like these I find really interesting because you're seeing how information from, from uh, miles and miles away from space having real impact right here on Earth. And if you'd like to hear more stories such as um, this particular example was, was more water focused, more public health focused. We have lots of different um, examples of our work with, uh, within other sectors that I shared before in the previous slide. So, uh, uh, you know, please go to our website and, and uh, see some of our impact stories there. And if you have any questions, do reach out to our team. Uh, so on the next slide, um, so, so far I've shared a little bit about um, our stories. What I wanted to do now is um, give you some of our media assets so that those of you who may be developing games and are, are looking for products to include, uh, they may find these sources useful. Um, I will add that, you know, we're, NASA is a data gathering and image uh, imaging instrument developing agency. So we have tons of amazing pictures images, um, movies that, that you can all access. Um, I am just sharing three libraries with you, but um, if you have any specific needs, um, we'll, we'll all share uh, our contact information at the end. Please please feel free to reach out and I can, I can try to connect you with appropriate um, resources or people. So this example is from the NASA Earth Observatory. Um, it uh, shares image stories, uh, articles, as well as maps. And what I've also listed on the slide is the image use policy. So um, many of these uh, resources have their specific image use policy and I've, I've shared the link to them. But if you do have any questions or are planning to use any of the resources that were shared through these um, sources, I, uh, you know, please reach out to the individual teams and they can give you better directions on how to incorporate the resources, how to appropriately credit them when necessary, um, particularly if you are using these resources for commercial use. Um, on the next slide, I um, share with you NASA Scientific Visualization Studio, which is based out of Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. And what's really cool about this visualization studio is that the, the data, that is, the information that are shared here have been developed with the scientists who have gathered and analyzed these, um, these data from, from the satellites. So the movies, the videos, um, uh, the images that you see are, are very high resolution and they're scientifically accurate. So, um, you know, great if you wanna incorporate them into your educational tools. Uh, again, I've listed copyright and credit information. Um, please uh, feel free to reach out to the teams uh, specifically on uh, their contact info should be on their websites um, if you have any specific questions or concerns. And the last uh, asset that I'll share with you is um, NASA Worldview. It's a really cool app with an interactive interface and what it allows you to do is browse layers of uh, imagery from multiple different instruments over a region at a particular time. So this imagery is updated daily. In fact, a lot of the data are available on this site um, as soon as the, the information is gathered, analyzed, and processed. So typically within three hours of the actual observation. Um, this is basically getting a view of what the planet looks like right now. You can zoom in on areas of interest. Um, you can even see Arctic and Antarctic uh, uh, regions of the globe if you want a full globe view. And then um, finally, there's also historical data available on the site. So if you want to have essentially like a time series data of, of what the same region looked at um, in re with respect to a particular type of observation over time. Um, NASA is an information sharing agency. So the data are openly available. 
And in many cases, even the APIs for a lot of these applications are available for you to use and incorporate into your products. Again, um, each kind of program has their specific policies, particularly if they are developing these assets with um, partners who are external to the agency. So I would um, err on the side of caution. And if you are planning to incorporate any of these into your products, um, please reach out to the teams and, and you know, um, there most everybody is is very excited for you to to use the data and incorporate them into your products. So um, uh, just just let the team know, and and I'm sure they'll be happy to to assist. Um, and on the last slide, I think I just share. So these these are specific resources, but um, on the next slide is just uh, the broad um, media usage uh, policy for NASA, um, and um, uh, you know. Particularly, uh, if, if you're using anything for advertising reasons, there are very strict rules about um, uh, NASA imagery and NASA insignia in particular being used for any kind of um, uh, advertising purposes. Um, it, you know, uh, there is a process that you need to follow and the NASA, the use of NASA logo is highly regulated. So um, just uh, reach, there are policies to follow and the, the, the links that I've shared on this site give you more information. So I just want to close by saying that, that we highly encourage you to use our data and tell stories of how our data can help us understand our planet better, make um, more informed decisions. And if you have any questions, please do reach out. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right, can um, everybody see my slide? Okay. All right, um, for those of you who just joined in, my name is Drew Robarge. I'm a museum specialist in division in medicine and science. Um, and Cody, you want to introduce yourself? My name is Cody Coltharp, and I'm a designer at the Center for Learning and Digital Access at the Smithsonian. So um, we're from the Smithsonian. Um, the Smithsonian has a lot of objects and resources, and we want, you know, we're very much a public facing institution. So we want to make sure that we share as much as we can with, with you all. Um, it's 19 museums, nine research centers, library archives, and the zoo. So the very big institution, um, Cody and I work across the mall. Like we walk maybe like 15 minutes to get um, to get to each other's offices. So, um, and there are tons of museums. So. A very big institution. So over. Um, so there's two things that we wanted to bring up that kind of happened within the last year that we kind of feel is important to share. Um, one of them is particular to my museum, the American History Museum. In November, we made this massive push to release more of our object record data online in various qualities. So some of them have a lot of good records, um, photos, um, description. And some others don't, so, but we've tried to, you know, push more out online and we'll continue to refine them, improve them as we go, as we do our work. And it's a lot of objects. So, um, but we're trying to be, um, make sure you were, you were aware of what we have. And then the second initiative is open access that was um, launched at the end of February. And the goal was to kind of make our resources more available for the public for any purposes, commercial and non-commercial. Um, you're free to share, remix, and even make money off of them in some cases. Um, I want to be very clear here, though, that not everything we have and put out is going to be open access. Some of them will probably never be. Um, and then, but some of them might be or just need more time but because of the time, the age of the object. So, um, and you are also responsible for getting permission for third parties that we require, but it was just going to depend on the object itself. Um, but it's it open access is a commitment that the institution is going to make. So um, what we want to do here is kind of show you how you find our things. Like so we have many, many different ways you can search. And the first one is is um, collections.si.edu, which is our kind of our main portal that you can search the things. And it's going to search all of our museum research centers, anything has a record online. Um, not everything is put up online. So maybe there is an off chance that Sometimes you might not find actual something, but it's a very good chance you'll find what you're looking for. So if you, if I was to search Telegraph, um, because I know it's going to come up. 
And, uh, and actually, the results actually came out quite different. So you find those archival material from the Archive of the American Garden. You find a library book. You find um, booklets and papers and stuff like that. And you can um, sort it by um, CC0. So that's what um, Creative Commons Zero, what, um, what we also call open access. And you notice there's a triple IF. Some of our images are triple IF. So if you engage that, you know, if you work with triple IF images, that um, I, we do have that some of our capabilities. You can also search by image or something like that. And then you can also search by museum. So let's just say I know where the object is and, um, you know, but how do I do it? So each museum has their own website that you could search at. Um, and one of the reasons why you want one search there is because either they could provide a little bit more specificity or the other reason is they tell you how do you get permissions for these kind of things. So you'll see the, here there's a rights and reproduction page for National Museum of American History. Um, and we do allow for fair use. I mean, there's a certain requirement. Um, but there's but if you want permission or need permission, um, here's how you do it. And so that it will be different for each museum. So just keep in mind if you're, you know, wanting to include objects from different museums that you're going to have, it's not going to be one a one stop shop. You're going to have to ask for permission in different museums. Um, so let me go back and show you a little bit of a search. So here you can show uh, only items with images or show only items with no use restriction. So, um, and so this will only find things that are objects within um, the American history site. So, mm, take a little while to load up and see. And you'll see here, and we'll talk a little bit about this. There's 3D models of these things, and um, we'll take you to a site that allows you to do that. Um, and and in here, there might be some more information, sometimes left, actually. Um, and you'll also see here, you'll see a CC0, and that's your, your, your way to know that um, it is open access and you're free to use it however you like. Um, and then there's another platform that Cody will explain that falls under his area uh, called Learning Lab. So I will turn it over to him. Thanks, Drew. Yeah, so I'm going to share my screen. And as Drew mentioned, uh, he was sharing the um, American histories search criteria. So the Learning Lab is a pan-institutional um, platform for both searching for the Smithsonian's digital resources, but also compiling them or putting them together. Um, it's a tool for, for using them. The primary audience for this is teachers uh, in K-12 schools, but anyone can use it, and it's absolutely free to use. Uh, so I will very quickly go through uh, what that is. Um, again, just like Drew did, I'll, I'll do a search for Telegraph. And as that's loading, I'm going to put in Learning Lab's website in the chat box. And so we actually just updated the website, so it's a little slow. Um, but as you can see, there's 1,900 resources containing the word telegraph. So these could be images or videos or text or audio files, whatever the Smithsonian has, uh, has curated on uh, telegraphs. So we also have, these are what in the, in the Learning Lab platform, we call these resources, the digital files, things like images and, and videos. Um, the platform is for also putting these resources together in something what we call collections. And so collections are groups of those resources that uh, users are putting together in order to tell a more comprehensive story about those objects. So you can see this is a collection on innovation and industry. And you can see there are lots of images, a few videos, and also some annotations, so some questions or hotspots that teachers have added in for their students. Um, so here's an example of one uh, where uh, the, uh, there's a, a group of a bunch of old white guys in a room. Um, but that is the general idea of the platform. Um, but another really interesting thing you can do is 
all of you want to know how can I get to the stuff and how can I use it. Um, if I was to filter the resources for CC0, for example, you would be able to see everything there is um, and totally free for you to use, to reuse, and uh, recycle, make shoes out of, make t-shirts, whatever you want. Uh, so I'll update this search. And it filters across all 19 museums, all the research facilities, and looks for all the CC0 resources that we have. And so any of these things that you find after you've filtered by um, CC0 public domain, uh, they're totally open for you to use in any way you want, commercially or not. Um, so it's a really neat resource for you to be able to look for the Smithsonian's digital resources and, and use them. Um, another one very similar is the Smithsonian's open access page. Uh, so I just accidentally killed it, but I'll reload it real quick. Um, and that's open access si.edu. Oops. Right. si.edu, open access. si.edu, open access. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and let me load that real quick and share it. Oops. Drew, what's the? I. It's not that ADU open access. Is it a backslash? Yeah. Huh. Open access. Yeah. There it is. Yeah, you notice all of our links actually is in the front. This one's actually after SI. .edu. Oh, it's not a. It's not an S dot SI. It's not a short link. Okay, great. Um, mm -hmm. so. Here is the um, open access's uh, main page. And again, the same type of thing. You can just do a search for Telegraph or whatever you're looking for, and we'll be able to find it. And on this website as well, um, they have some featured platforms that use the open access resource, the Learning Labs right here, which I was just talking about. Um, but there's also the 3d.si.edu website that Drew's going to go into in a minute. Um, but again, it's the same type of thing where you're able to filter by CC0 resources and use these however you want. And Drew, I'm going to switch it back to you. OK. And there's also a FAQ on that side that helps explain in greater detail you know, what open access means and what are some of the potential restrictions and why we might restrict some of the objects um, from being open access. So some of it has to do with copyright. Some of it has to do with um, provenance. Um, PII and stuff like that. So um, I think it just provides a little bit more context. So, but the vast um, majority are are going to be moving forward um, available yeah. to be used. So I'm gonna... yeah, that that's the goal. But we have a long backlog. Yeah. We have a lot of objects to be able to assess. So um, okay. So next, the other thing that um, Cody mentioned was um, yeah, you know, not only is um, objects available, but data as well. So yeah, you can sign up for our API, um, and it's free. You just it's a it's a free API, and here's the instructions on how you can retrieve an API through JSON. Um, I tried it, and um, I got it. I I mean, I'm sure you can you know figure out ways you can creatively use it, but just know that there. I also mentioned Triple IF, which also delivers information through manifest and JSONs as well. Um, so I just want to make sure that it's available. And then, um, so as Cody mentioned, like the 3D objects, so that I'm sure that's what people are interested in, you know. Um, and a lot of these 3D objects are going to be open access, um, and there are a wide variety of different objects across different museums. I mean, they're very small. We're, we're working a lot on um, Digitizing our collections in 3Ds, it you know it's a very it's a challenge um, to scale up, um, but I think that's something we're looking into. Um, and if you click in, and they just revamped this website, which is you know great. So here you have the you know the information associated with it, and you can see that the object in there. And then if you click here on the download, um, it will give you 
this one didn't have does have a lot of options, but I'll, others do like different resolution size. You can actually use it for 3D printing um, models in Unity, and we'll show some examples of that actually right now. So back to you, Cody. All right, sweet. So I'm gonna switch to the slideshow, and all right, cool. Let me present. Um, so yeah, so my role at the Smithsonian is pretty cool. I get to figure out what neat things some of my colleagues at the Smithsonian are doing and try to match the, the digital content that we have, so videos or research or data, to those scientists or historians or artists uh, or curators and try to tell their story through the medium of games. So it's pretty pretty awesome. Um, job to be able to tell those stories. Uh, so one such example is the Wright Flyer. I took the th DPO's 3D scan of the Wright Flyer, and I took uh, land, uh, satellite data of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, and I simulated some wind and created an interactive where you get to try to fly on an exact replica of the Wright Flyer, what similar conditions it would be like to, to fly in that time. Um, and so there's also a school, a learning lab collection that um, students are able to learn more contextual information uh, connected to that collection. Uh, the next one is uh, one I did last year. Uh, we have this uh, astronomer named Kimberly Arcand, and she's literally like a rocket scientist. She's very, very brilliant. And she took data from across the electromagnetic spectrum, so everything from infrared to uh, microwaves to X-ray data to gamma ray data, from um, satellite telescopes, and she created a 3D representation of a supernova called Cassiopeia A. Um, and there's this big giant star that's exploding, and this explosion is 17 light years across. So super interesting and amazing data. And uh, she let me use it and put it into a game. So that was super cool. So in the game, you're able to kind of travel through this explosion and see what it would look like. Um, and uh, and, and, and put yourself at the center of this exploding star. And so there's a YouTube 360 video, there's an online interactive, and again, there's that uh, contextual collection for our students to go through to learn more. And there's also in this collection a video about um, chem, and you get to see what it's like to be uh, a scientist like that. Um, and the third one I'm gonna talk about is the one Drew and I worked on most recently, and it was launched uh, only a couple months ago, the Smithsonian Secrets of the Sea. And in this uh, interactive, we took 3D scans again from the DPO that had done uh, some scans of coral, and we took lots of images from the Museum of Natural History on uh, their fish collections. And then we contacted a, a renowned marine biologist, Dr. Nancy Knowlton, and she was able to work with us from the ground up to tell the story of this interconnected community of life that lives in a coral reef, and uh, so it's it's a you know a really fascinating look at what it would be like if you were a microscopic little fish and swimming around in, in this big giant coral reef that's like a city, and you go around and you discover the sea life there. Um, and so in this project, you can also see that there's the online interactive, there's a contextualized learning lab collection. Um, and there's also a hands-on card game coming soon for people with no access to technology, as well as a video about Nancy and all the amazing work she's done over decades. So that's all I've got, Drew. I'm going to... Yeah, you want to you go to the next yeah, slide? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do your slides and mic myself. Okay. Okay. Um, so one of the ways I'm using um, 3D objects, actually, for our museum is experimenting with technology to use um, 3D models that are, can be delivered through ultrasonic waves. Um, so creating uh, basically tactile models for people who are blind or have low vision um, virtually. So, so what you see in the picture is a screenshot of a Unity scene that I'm developing with a device from Ultraleap. Um, still very much in the early stages, but we're taking the um, basically the Apollo capsule, shrinking it down into, you know, Hopefully we're in a palm size way that people, you know, can experiment. And then we're I'm looking at a different way to maybe even allow for magnification, you know, areas of, you know, areas you can touch specifically. Um, it's again very much in the early stages. We'll have to see if it's effective or not, but that's just one way we're trying to use it. And then um, 
one of the things I quickly did in VR. Um, it's not related to any project I'm working on, but just to show you some of the potentials of it is um, using a VR video. Um, I guess um, I have to share my screen. So. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to pull it up. And again, not optimized, so it's gonna be a little bit clunky, but um, you can get a sense of like, I just literally walked into the um, the spacecraft and you can look around, um, imagine with, you know, a little bit of animation, um, you can use, completely use this model, you know, it, open assets, you can use this model for, you know, if you were creating a Apollo 11 game, um, and put people what it feels like to be in the Apollo 11. So uh, I hope somebody does that. So, um, so yeah, so that's all I got. Um, Great, thank you guys so much. If you actually, Cody, can you go to the next slide so that we have our contact information all up? And thank you all to the uh, folks who have made it this far. I'm gonna link in the chat, all of the links, all of the links every single last one of them that we've mentioned here um, in this Google Doc. So feel free to, to rush over there and enjoy. Um, if you have any troubles connecting to it, let me know. Uh, all of our contact information is up there in case you'd like to connect further around any of these particular projects. And uh, we know it was a whirlwind, but we're very excited that you all have made it this far. And now we are going to be inviting questions um, I've already collected a couple of them that have come up through the conversation, but if you have any other questions, please put them in the chat and I will MC for you. Um, one of the first questions was from Stuart Criley and he asked, and this is a, for a NASA expert, I'm assuming, on the panel. For NASA Earth Science, does that include data for U2s? And I'm assuming that was very early on in your presentation, so that was for the applied Earth Science. Um, yeah, uh, so I'm not really sure if I under, like, um, I know we have our um, flights that go out and collect uh, information. Um, uh, it's our airborne science campaign. Uh, I don't know if we're using commercial, I believe you twos are, um, you're talking about the, the Lockheed Martin um, uh, uh, aircraft. But I, I, I don't know if we have any in our fleet, but I know that we have our own uh, airborne fleet that collects information that has sensors on board. Um, so yeah, I, I can share a link to our, our flight campaigns. Um, it's in the chat, but yeah, if you have, I don't know if that answered your question, but let me know if it didn't. If it didn't, feel free to point of clarification into the chat. Um, we also have a couple of questions about the, the nature of open data and the nature of uh, how we can foster open data. So one of the questions was, are there any games that are currently in the process of fostering the release of open data by governments? And the second question that dovetails with that was, um, it's amazing to see how many, so many projects connecting data and games. However, don't you all find lots of res resistance with governments, uh, within governments to support the release of data? And full disclosure, we're, loosely representing US perspectives on this. So we can't speak for all of the governments on these particular issues. But um, one of the things that we're seeing an increase rate actually is an interest in providing open data portals for projects. So there's a couple of different initiatives that are focused on that. We have highlighted some of them here. The Opportunity Project is another that's conducted through the census. Uh, NARA has a lot of digital the National uh, Archives there, Library of Congress also, and I believe that they've also put out calls for RFPs uh, along those lines of how to make those uh, resources come to life even further. Um, we'll also, one of the links that's in that Google document to the Federal Game Guild at the very top, it's an Easter egg for having read the document, I suppose. There's a PDF of funding opportunities with the full disclosure that nobody on this panel has funding opportunities that they are presenting here today. However, we know people who do, and so we've collected a lot of those resources and put them into a PDF on that website. Um, but, oh, go ahead. Yeah, 
Oh, I was just going to add to the, the open data policy. Well, first, uh, I wanted to clarify that um, I, I'm speaking for me, not for NASA. Um, you know, the, the uh, so just wanted to make sure I are present, right? <laughs> our opinions are our own. Opinions are our own, not, not of our agency or our programs. But um, I did want to share that for NASA in particular, um, our goal is to, we're fortunate that our mission is gathering and sharing data um, for research. So essentially the, the agency has been a champion of, you know, pushing for everything to be available as soon as it's available to the public. So um, I, we have our, our Earth Science has our data policy that I'm happy to share. Um, but, but yeah, I think it varies from agency to agency as well, so. In a lot of ways, we've seen those sort of uh, the Wilson Center's collaborated with NASA, uh, various divisions of NASA, really on how that can be conducted through the democratization democratization of science, citizen science. Um, so a lot of those open data portals are available for research, and one of the things that I'm seeing a shift of is how to make that more accessible to a general public. Um, okay, so we have. Yeah, sorry, no. Yeah, I'll just say that, you know, sometimes not necessarily not the will, but the resources are not necessarily there to, um, but we're working on it. And I think it's a shift in mission. Um, our mission's always remain the same, increase in division of knowledge. It's just um, how we do it and who does it is always constantly evolving and changing. So, but. Um, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and so we have another question that's popped up here and that's, uh, what's the best resource for real world height map and corresponding color data to recreate terrain in games? What's the highest uh, resolution publicly available? Are there any user-friendly tools to preview this data? I will ping pong that to one of y'all because I don't have any terrain data I'm working with. Um, so I can share for ours. Um, uh, I don't know the answer, the specific answers off the top of my head. We have a lot of data products that look at elevation and terrain. Um, if you go to earthdata.nasa.gov, and um, here's a, I, I put in the chat, like a, a specific uh, um, uh, page on that, on that website about uh, digital elevation products, um, you're going to find some more resources. Uh, typically, NASA's uh, resolution isn't going to be the very high resolution that you would get from more um, private uh, industry um, uh, viewers. Like we are, we have some high resolution data, but a lot of it, because we're trying to get global coverage, is a little bit coarser spatial resolution. Um, but but see if any of those uh, uh, look good to you. Otherwise, um, uh, yeah, yeah, just just reach out and and I'll I'll see if there's updated um, information. All right. Well, we while we think of a couple more questions, we have about five more minutes before we need to wrap up here. Um, one question that came up, which is, I guess, a very fun question. So what are some of the best collections you can find on the Smithsonian's website? Cody, do you want to tackle that one? That was from and of course. Uh, <laughs> uh, so Collections can mean a lot of different things at this at the Smithsonian. Collections, to me, uh, because I'm at um, I'm at the Learning Lab, is user created content created in the Learning Lab. Um, but collections to any of the other museums means what's in their um, what's in their warehouses. So uh, you know, you could say what are the best exhibitions or what are the best collections on the Learning Lab. Um, but sometimes that's one and the same because often now curators at museums are, are turning their exhibitions into digital um, learning lab collections. Uh, yeah, um, some, some, I've seen some really interesting uh, ones created by students recently. They're, one of my colleagues, Tess, is, is leading a wor uh, workshop in, for the last two weeks. And so she has about 200 teachers that are learning how to use the site and they've created some really fun ones. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can pull up some links while uh, while the next question comes, and I'll put them in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's a really tough one. Uh, people always ask me what my favorite object is, and even that's hard. So much less a collection. Um, I think each, you know, each um, collect. 
Yeah, I'm, I work in medicine and science. Um, I've seen, you know, some interesting things related to medicine. I think uh, I've grown a greater appreciation for medicine, especially, you know, in this time period we live in, you know, um, I think, you know, we have a lot of medicine collections um, dating back, you know, material medica to um, patent, patent medicines, you know, snake oil medicines and all that kind of stuff. So um, it's a very, um, you know, it's a very sensory experience, you know, visually and even it's, you know, so. So I enjoy that. I enjoy the medicine collection a lot and something I work a lot with, so. Great. So I see, um, oh, can you paste the link to the PDF? Well, the link is at the top. I'm not gonna direct link it because we keep this updated. And so the, the page is going to be the most up-to-date version. I wouldn't hot link the PDF itself, but it's right at the top in big bold letters, um, eight, a head or two sort of um, right there. And uh, so one of the questions, if there, uh, one of the other questions that came up, do we know of any initiatives connecting games and data release? And to my knowledge, I don't think so. If I, if I haven't heard of it quite yet, um, but that's a conversation if for definitely that we'd be happy to connect you with some colleagues. If you are looking to make a particular game, um, maybe there's some data that's coming out soon. So definitely feel free to, to contact us around that and we can do some internal ping ponging on it. Um, I guess one last question I wanted to ask the panel while we wrap up here is what, um, where do you see the next steps going for these projects? Like, is there any anything new or how you would like to see it sort of gamified or anything like that? Cody, you got a lot of applause for the, the card game, so. Oh, I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, where's the card game? Um, yeah, I'm working on it. <laughs> uh, uh, so um, after, yeah, after the card version of Secrets of the Sea, and we're also gonna try to do a 360, YouTube 360 um, visualization, uh, I'm, the next project that I'm gonna be working on is visualizing the hunt between a bat and a frog looking for a mate. So I'll, I'll be um, using the res uh, working with a scientist at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute named Rachel Page and she is a bat expert and she's super, super fascinating. And so she'll be providing a lot of the narrative and it's a two player, um, uh, two player game where one player takes the role of the bat and the other is the frog and the bat's looking for the frog and the frog's looking for a mate. Um, so that's about this time next year. Yeah, I would like to see, you know, um, our object being used in games in, not as like museum exhibits or kind of more static way, but actually like you actually using a hat or a, a dress or something like that. And along the way, you actually kind of explain it, but it's not super fluid. Like it's, you know, it's natural part of the game. And, um, and ideally it would save you time, you know, like you don't have to model, you're using the real thing. And I think that you can say like, look, this is, I didn't make this from you know from scratch. I, this this is a real thing. I think that could be really fascinating if we could, you know, students to see that kind of real life connection and not, you know, art. You know, not not a model of something. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and and for me, I see um, I see two potential areas that I think would be really interesting to gamify. One would be um, data analysis. So to look at our data and maybe create new data products. Um, if there's a way to gamify that process, that would be that would be super cool. And then the other one is um, because we work at the interface of earth science and other sectors, um, we're often working with people who, um, you know, I, like I personally don't have a background in earth science. My background's in medicine. So we, we have a lot of uh, cross cutting topics. And um, uh, so some kind of a, a game based uh, training that allows people to understand uh, not just where to access the data, but how to how to use it, how to think about it. Um, that would be super cool as well. That's something that we're trying to explore. Awesome. Those are all uh, very 
small asks for the broader game development community to work on. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I really appreciate everyone's time. Again, thank you so much for joining us um, here. And if there's anything that we can, any questions that we can answer, our contact information is available. Feel free to tweet out also the list of resources and uh, hope to connect soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.